7, 8, 9, 10. И здравствуйте, дорогие гости, дорогие слушатели нашей трансляции. Сегодня у нас... Мы продолжаем сегодня наши эфиры в рамках фестиваля. Он особенный не только тем, что он юбилей 10 а тем, что он впервые, мы сделали его цифровым. И сегодня у нас в гостях очень-очень особенный гость, мы можем уже видеть его на экране. Его зовут Майкл Долан, также его, также его знают, как он очень известен как Махайоги Прабу. И прежде всего он известен тем, что он вместе с Бхакти Судхиром Гасами Махараджем первый составил и издал книжку, которая считается вот просто практически как азбукой Гаудея Вашнавизма в настроении Шичтани Сарасват Матха. И эта книжка называется «Поиск Шри Кришны. Прекрасной реальности». Также они составили, вот он сейчас ее показывает, это Маха-йоги, вот смотрим, приветствуем, он просто прекрасный, замечательный человек, интереснейшая личность, он профессор в Мексиканском университете, и сейчас мы будем с ним проводить интервью. Хочу вас предупредить, что интервью будет на английском языке, поэтому, дорогие Слушатели, которые не владеют этим языком, просим нас простить. Перевод обязательно будет доступен чуть-чуть позже. А сейчас просим остаться с нами, всех, кто владеет английским. Вы послушаете, можете задавать, писать вопросы. А мы же с Махайоги просто поговорим, потому что я имею честь знать его уже 6 лет. Я переводил несколько раз, выгуливал его по Киеву. И для меня сейчас большая честь присутствовать в эфире. И вот что-то говорить, представлять его. Собственно, давайте перейдем к нашему гостю. So, Mahayogi, dear Mahayogi Prabhu, I just made a short interview and I mentioned everything, everything that was worth mentioning, that Sri Krishna, beautiful reality, about you being the author alongside with Srila Bhakti Sutir Goswami Maharaj. And, well, I kind of mentioned you're looking very good, Mahayogi Prabhu. I'm very, very, very <laughs> proud to be here, to be your interviewer for today. So, can you please Tell us some invitational words. How you doing and life going? Please tell us something. We are done, Davats. Well, Hare Krishna, Prabhu, and uh, I'm very happy to be here virtually with you. Uh, it's a very dangerous and difficult situation we find ourselves in right now, but uh, I'm happy healthy holy and uh, everything is is good over here on my side oh um, that's, that's, uh, that's sure. great to hear and I don't know you're in mexico in which city here. yes i'm right here in mexico and uh this is my i i think this is the fourth time i've par participated here with uh veda life this time it's it's virtual but i was in kiev in Uh, 2014 and again in I think it was 2016 and then again in exactly 2018. yes so this, yes this yes. year it's the virtual participation but I love the people of Kiev I love the people of Ukraine they're very sweet warm and small people and uh, I'm happy to answer your questions and be of service in any way Okay, so uh, I'll I'll ask you an immediate question as as far uh, and it's it concerns Sri Krishna beautiful reality of course this book because you're widely known as the one and only who made it with Gosai Maharaj. So can you please tell us what was the idea? Why why did you decided to make this book for us all? What was what was the idea? The motivation to To serve your guru, Srila Shtar Maharaj, as he asked it to you, or was it your own initiative? Can you please describe how was this first book made and printed? What were the adventures during this print? Uh, can you share this? It's very interesting, I think. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I found myself in a spiritual crisis in 1981 or so. I was practicing yoga. And uh, Goswami Maharaj was a friend of mine. He had a small mission in San Francisco. And uh, I heard about Sridhar Maharaj and wanted to visit him. So I went to Goswami Maharaj and got a letter from him of introduction and then flew to Calcutta and then met 
Sridhar Maharaj at his ashram in Navadweep Dam. And I was immediately impressed uh, by his message. He delivered a very deep understanding of yoga vision, a proper way of seeing. And uh, what we were calling at the time Krishna consciousness, which is a particular form of very high consciousness accessible by great seers, Mahajans, uh, very developed personalities. And at once I could see Sridhar Maharaj was one such saint. So a small collection of us uh, sat at his feet there in India over a period of months and listened to his message. And uh, we found that his message was very profound. For example, in the back of the book, you can see it says here, all of us are children of nectar. In, in Sanskrit, the word for nectar is the same as the word for immortal or eternal. So we're, we're sons and daughters of the eternal, if you like, as eternal spirit souls. And we're looking for an eternal connection, but not just a vague merging into the oneness of the eternal, but we're looking for a sweet connection. So this is one of the things he told us. He said, oh, you sons of nectar, sons of the nectarine ocean sea, listen to me. You were born in nectar. You were born to taste nectar. You must not allow yourselves to be satisfied by anything but nectar. Awake, arise, and search for that nectar. So the sort of vision of divinity that was given by Sridhar Maharaj was something that has been touched upon by great saints in every religious sect all over the world to some extent. But uh, Sridhar Maharaj pointed out that India has given a higher conception of the spiritual world that's found in the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. Now, I'd studied these books, but here was a practitioner, an adept, a master of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And his message, although some people believe that it's, it's hard to understand, all right, it's a little esoteric, but the way he delivered his message was very clear to me. And uh, at that time, this is back in 1981, I thought, we need to publish this. And I spoke again to uh, Goswami Maharaj some months later. I was in Africa. I was in South Africa. And uh, I said, you know, I know how we can put together a book like this. It, it's not that difficult. Uh, but I need your help. And he said, well, yes, I need your help. Why don't you come to San Jose and we'll see what we can do. So uh, I traveled to San Jose, California in 1982. And at that time, uh, Goswami Maharaj had a very ingenious scheme for recording all these different lectures by Sridhar Maharaj. So based on what I had heard, uh, what he had heard, and the different tapes that we had listened to, we found certain themes that recurred in uh, Sridhar Maharaj's message. For example, one of them was the search for Sri Krishna. Uh, the Vedas, the Vedanta says, uh, Atato Brahma Jigyasa. It's time to search out what is spirit. And this is a, an important theme or macho for many different yogis, find out what is spirit. But Sridhar Maharaj wanted to go beyond that. He said, well, you know, spirit really, what does that mean? It's a dry thing. It's, it's not clear. It's vague. Uh, on the other hand, we're looking for something deeper. We're looking for a sweet conception, a conception of nectar. If you think about uh, the innate nature of the soul. It's Satchit Ananda. Uh, it goes towards what's called rasa. And rasa means uh, pleasure, the juice of life, the nectar. So we're all after that nectar, but we look for it in, in different places. But real nectar 
it can be found in a devotional relationship with uh, Krishna. And this was being spelled out by Sri Dharmaraj, how to do that, how to come in connection with divinity uh, through dedication. So this was his message, above and beyond simply searching for spirit. He said, don't get involved in uh, Atato Brahma Jigyasa or the search for spirit, but search for Sri Krishna. That's Krishna who's done that. And uh, we found this message to be very profound and very helpful for us at the time. So we set about creating uh, this book, The Search for Sri Krishna. And uh, we started out by printing a small pamphlet, 32 pages, at a local printing press, just to see how it would go. And we immediately sold a thousand copies. So then we pulled together the financial resources. We drew together uh, a group of very dedicated devotees, a uh, uh, spiritual production team, uh, and we called it Guardian of Devotion Press. And we had a photographer, uh, Vidagda Madhava. There was Yudhamanyu, who uh, was in charge of financial resources. There was Rishab Dev, who was a a businessman who uh, started Spiritual Sky Incense in Los Angeles, California. There were uh, a number of important devotees who helped us, Ramai, sorry, Pujari. And this spiritual team worked very hard together over a period of about two years. And uh, every day I would sit down and listen to the tapes by Sridhar Maharaj and t transcribe them on my typewriter, and a week or two, I would sit down and go, Swami Maharaj, we'd look at the transcripts to see what we had. And we began seeing a pattern. Sri Maharaj would have spoken three or four lectures on the same subject. So we tried to draw together different lectures and create a synthetic work that would be pleasing to him. And it was. In his lifetime, he liked very much the publication of the search for Sri Krishna. He had it translated into Bengali and published there at the Mott to distribute in India. And he considered it an important work. He said that what have I, what have I said in lectures and informal talks like this one, you have collected in a very scientific way and given it form. So in a sense, you're like the Vyas uh, of this age. And he gave that high praise to Goswami Maharaj, and I'm, or at the time I was, Goswami Maharaj's scribe, so to speak. So if Goswami Maharaj could have been compared to Vyas, I like to think that my role was something like that of Ganesh. Also, I was. I, was <laughs> I just wanted to joke about it, and you said it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was oh. a little fan. <laughs> uh, dear Mukha Prabhu, um. And how was how was the idea to make for other books like Sri Guru and His Grace, Golden Volcano, and Search? Did you like decide to split this part? It was this, is the are these those patterns that you are speaking about right now, or did it, the idea of publishing some more books revealed later on after the success of the first book? Can you please share uh, how the other four books uh, made? Well. We were prepared to publish all of Sri Maharaj's lectures in that form. Uh, the search for Sri Krishna was a big success. Uh, in, immediately, our book was copied in different parts of the world and then reproduced, and also in India. So, our original three thousand copies went into something like fifty thousand copies. So. Also, our community in San Jose, California, had formed around the idea of publishing and distributing these books. So another book was a natural. And at that time, there were so many different yoga groups and yoga societies and even different Krishna consciousness societies, not only in the United States, but even in San Francisco. So everybody wanted to know more about the position of the guru. 
And this is because the Krishna consciousness movement was begun in the 1960s by a very powerful Indian guru named uh, Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada. And uh, he created a large following of about 10 or 15,000 uh, disciples all over the world. But he passed away in the 1970s. So what happens when the guru uh, moves on, when the guru moves on to the spiritual world? Who becomes the guru? The problem of session. The Americans tried to take that position themselves, but many of us were not satisfied with their leadership. So everyone wanted a kind of a guide, to a manual to explain what is a guru, what's his position, uh, what's a disciple, what's the relationship like, uh, what are the qualifications of a guru. So we then published another book, and that book was mostly... Uh, Let's see if I have it here. Yeah. yeah, here we are. This book was mostly uh, based on the different questions that we put to uh, Sridhar Maharaj. The devotees came from all over the world, from Czechoslovakia, from Russia, from Venezuela, from the United States, from uh, England, France, Germany, uh, Mexico. Uh, disciples of Srila Prabhupada with serious questions. They wanted to move on to the next level. We were all basically beginners. So we sat at Srila Sri Maharaj's feet and we, we examined him very carefully to see if he had the qualities that we were looking for. It was a very sort of arrogant, condescending thing to do on our part. But we discovered that he was indeed a very deep uh, guru and based on his teachings about guru uh, we published this book Sri Guru's Grace and he has an interesting argument on the back of the book he says he explains that nobody's perfect so insofar as we're not perfect we need help and that help comes in the form of a spiritual guide and if you don't look for a guide or a teacher it's only arrogance so, and this is a problem of every student everywhere. Anytime we're trying to learn something, it's very difficult because as long as you think you know something, you can't learn it. So you have to forget everything. No, he told us the story of the, of the $5 piano teacher. You know that story? No, no. Can you please tell it if, if possible right it's now? Very, on air? very simple. Very simple. There's this man, he's kind of an intermediate piano player. He thinks he's pretty good. He knows a little Beethoven, mm -hmm. a little Mozart. He goes to the teacher and the teacher is busy with a student. And the student's really terrible. He's a beginner. And uh, the intermediate player is thinking, oh God, this guy's terrible. Ew, you know. And he's just uh -huh. finishing up the lesson. So the teacher says, okay, uh, let's see, that was one hour. That'll be five dollars. And the uh, student pays him $5 and goes. And then the intermediate student sits down with the teacher. And the teacher says, uh, can you play something? And he plays a little Mozart. And the teacher goes, ew, uh, how long have you been playing? He says, 10 years. Oh, OK, it'll be $10 an hour. Uh -huh. And the man says, 10 well, wait a minute, you charge the beginner over there $5 an hour, and look, I know so much. So how can you charge me twice as much? And the, the teacher said, well, you know, I have first I have to unteach you what you think you know, and then I can teach you. So I have to charge you twice as much, because it's twice the work. So that was our position when we went to Sridhar Maharaj. We all thought, Oh, we know so much about, you know, Vaidhi Bhakti and, you know, Siddhanta uh -huh. and Raga Bhakti and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But really, we didn't know anything. We were very simple Western people. And now, those books that we published became my heart and soul because I would spend two or three, not only did I listen to the lectures when I was in, you know, India with Sridhar Maharaj, 
and I tried to take that message to heart and follow his teachings. Then later, I had to recycle the message hundreds of times while we were editing the books. And in the you know 35 years since then, not a day goes by that I'm not reflecting on what he taught me and how to put it into practice. And I'm not a very good student, but uh, his teachings were indispensable to me. So I, I recommend both of these books, The Search for Sri Krishna uh, and uh, Sri Guru and His Grave. And then after that, we felt we felt the need for a book about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu when we produced uh, The Golden Volcano of Divine Love, which has to do with uh, how God himself uh, wants to feel what it is like to serve God, because to serve God is even a greater ecstasy than to be God himself. And uh, that's, Sri Dharmar made some interesting points based on the dialectic of Hegel, the teachings of Kaviraj Goswami, and uh, the Shikshastakam of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So that's in that book. And after that, we did um, The Loving Search for the Lost Servant, the idea being that just as you're looking for God, he's also looking for you because he feels incomplete if uh, there's not that interchange of uh, the give and take of divine love. And after that, we produced another book called Subjective Evolution of Consciousness because people were interested in trying to understand uh, what is the nature of reality. So it's a very deep ontological book which explains that uh, consciousness is all reality. Yeah, and there's also the meaning of God Mantra revealed there. I remember that in this book, The Subjective Evolution of Consciousness, there is also some anthology given about mantras as well. I remember it uh, in the end. Of yeah, the that's right. The Gaya Mantra is explained there. A lot of people, especially you know, astronomers, astrologers, they look at the world from uh, the point of view of moving objects. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, scientists and the world of physics, they're not interested in consciousness. They, can, they, they think it's not a problem because you can't see it. Of course, you're using your consciousness to see with, uh, trying, to, trying to discover consciousness in a materialistic sense is something like going outside your house and looking inside the window to see if anybody is in there. It's a paradox. Uh, the materialistic construction of the universe is sometimes taken as a jumping off point for interpreting the Srimad Bhagavatam, for example. And so people want to construct a planetarium based on the hierarchy of of planets and they'll say well okay you know indra loka is above uh Bhu loka and brahma loka is above indra loka and above brahma loka is sati loka but we know from science that above and below are very relative concepts in astronomy right. above is north, but north of what? South of what? These are relative things. Mm -hmm. So Srila Sridharmash applies Einsteinian relativity to the study of, of consciousness. He sees this universe as a sort of a quantum universe among many millions of different universes, all generated from uh, consciousness. Without consciousness, there's no matter. So the question is posed, is is the world in the mind, or is the mind in the world? And so what is the answer to this question, Mahayagi Prabhu? Yeah, does stone create matter? I mean, does stone create consciousness, or does consciousness create stone? It's very simple if you think about it, because if you just look around you, everything around you is man-made. It's all created by consciousness. Some, there's an architect who thought about, well, how am I going to put this bookshelf? Or, like the bookshelf behind me, all those books were printed somewhere. 
it's, trees were cut down. It was all in somebody's mind. I have direct experience of this as a screenwriter, because as a screenwriter, you write a movie, and then you hand out the script, you start to create the reality that you had in your mind. So how how it's a difficult thing to work out because it's counterintuitive how mind creates matter. But consciousness is everywhere. You can't go somewhere and not find consciousness. So how is it that consciousness permeates matter and that consciousness develops into matter? It's a very subtle thing. Uh, there are different takes on the Vedanta. For example, Madhvacharya, he likes the idea that nothing is one. Everything is two. There's no uh, unity any, anywhere. God is God and you are you. And there's no uh, cross-pollinization there. They're, they're completely distinct ideas. Uh, his was a reaction to Shankara. Shankara says every, everything is one. I am you and you are me and we are all together, like the Beatles said, you know. But uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he says, no, that's not, you know, Mavacharya, I like him. You know, I like his sampradaya. I, I'm accepting his sampradaya. But M Mahaprabhu has more in common with other commentators like Nimbark and Ramanuja, who say, well, you know, there's sunshine and there's the sun. The sun ray and the sun, they're the same thing really, but one is the energetic and the other one is, is the energy. So there is similarity, but there's distinction. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he developed a chinti beta beta tattva, which is simultaneous oneness and distinction. And uh, oftentimes we, we miss the subtlety there. We don't see how consciousness and matter are interconnected, but that was something Chaitanya Mahaprabhu invited us to uh, discover, not only through introspection, but through the power of the mantra. And that's described in, in uh, Subjective Evolution. And after those five books, it was difficult for us to continue uh, publishing. Uh, it was an expensive proposition, uh, publishing books and printing them. Sridhar Maharaj passed away, Govinda Maharaj uh, became the new Acharya, and uh, I, I moved on, you know, time passed, but uh, I'm proud of what we did there at the Guardian of Devotion Press, and uh, so is Goswami and all the others who participated. In that. So thank you very much for asking, I really appreciate it. For me, one of the great things about publishing those books is, you know, when you write something, Achyutananda, sometimes you're writing it for yourself. The great writers all yeah. did that, like uh, Stendhal. Yeah, I understand. You know, he was he was a contemporary of of Balzac. He he would write about uh, he wrote a book about uh, m music, I think, just because he wanted to understand that. So, you asked me like, what was my motivation? My motivation was I wanted to understand the teachings of Sri Ramaraj. I wanted to live them, and uh, later on, I felt. I'm creating a record, and maybe the time will come when I really need to sit down and read these books uh, again and study them. And, you know, time passed in my life, and suddenly these books that were kind of popular in the 1980s, some, somehow they went to Russia, they went to Ukraine, they went to China, and now, 30 years later, uh, young people are coming up to me and they're telling me, hey, did you know? Oh man, you gotta hear this. Oh, you sons of nectar, sons of the nectarine ocean sea, listen to me, you were born in nectar. I'm like, oh my God. Oh my God, they're teaching me now. And it's, it's a really, Is this real as you know, Oh, it's, beautiful it's very thing. cute. Yeah. It's a beautiful uh, thing. Being a teacher is hard uh, because your students or jamming you all the time. You're stupid. You don't know anything. And you're like, yes, I do. You listen to me. This is my teaching. But yeah, yeah. what's even better, even better is if they come up to you 30 years later and you discover they're a lawyer, you know, they're a doctor, they're a judge. And they go, oh, you changed my life. 
You know, really? How is that possible? <laughs> I changed. <laughs> yes, you hired me to go into the law. I did. Somebody, I was giving a talk like this in Thailand, and uh, somebody called in and said, "Oh, that's Maha Yogi. You changed my life." I said, "I did." They said, "Yes, you did." We had a bunch of. We had ten thousand dollars in nineteen eighty. Uh, or 83 or 84, I don't remember the year. And we were going to buy a house, my wife and I. We had just enough money to buy a house. And we went to you and we said, should we go to India and see Sridhar Maharaj or should we buy a house? And I told them, are you crazy? Go see Sridhar Maharaj. You don't need a house. You can always buy a house. Yeah. Go. <laughs> and so later, 30 years later, I see him, I'm on a TV program like this. And they said, you changed our life. And I thought they were going to say, oh, no, you know, we never bought that house. And because of you, <laughs> because of you, we didn't have But no, they we said you changed our life. And it's so wonderful so, to hear from you, Mahayogi Prabhu. And it's very, very inspiring to hear that this words that you share with us. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you. Just time you inspired me again. Uh, I I feel some ecstasy <laughs> right now. You know, <laughs> I'm no, talking to you. Right? Yeah, well, uh, that's great. You make me feel. You know, here I am sitting in Mexico uh, in a little room with a wall of books, but by the miracle of modern technology, we're reaching out and touching people in Ukraine, Russia, Mexico. India, all over the world. And uh, that's the gift that Sri Omar gave me. So if I have anything interesting to say or give, it's what he gave me back then, uh, you know, 35 years ago when we were making those books. I tried very hard to live up to uh, his teachings. It's not so easy. You know, the yoga path yeah. moves in a crooked So sometimes you're closer to samadhi and the truth and divinity and you understand atma yoga karma paramatma dharma all that and sometimes you're lost but you know if you feel lost you can pick up a copy of the search for sri krishna and take a look at that or you can connect like we're connecting now through uh, the miracle of of this technology that we have so you know we miss Sri Maharaj, we miss Govinda Maharaj and our gurus, but we have this opportunity to connect by long distance. And long distance connection is not only over the internet, it's also through time. I live with Sri Maharaj, I live with his teachings, I live with Govinda Maharaj and with Srila Prabhupada. And uh, they're part of me, they're in my heart. So. Whatever I do, I'm thinking, what would Prabhupada do here? What would Sri Dharmaraj do? What would he think? You know, Srila Prabhupada taught me how to walk, you know, and how to eat, how to mm -hmm. talk. You know, he gave yeah. disciples a discipline. He showed you, okay, don't eat meat, uh, fish, eggs, uh, chant Hare Krishna, uh, be compassionate, try to live a spiritual life, don't lie, don't cheat. He gave us values, no illicit sex, you know, no intoxication. Uh, but Srila Sridhar Maharaj took it to a higher level. He taught us how to think. He thought, well, okay, look, you read this in the, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Prabhupada says this, your god brother says that, and now you're in real time. Uh, what do you do? You know, how do you think? How do you harmonize different things? He used to say uh, religion means harmonization, proper proper adjustment. Uh, mm -hmm. So I feel, really, he taught me how to think. Govinda Maharaj, on the other hand, took it to an even higher level. Srila Sridhar Maharaj used to say, in many ways, Govinda Maharaj is more qualified than I am. And in this sense, Govinda Maharaj was born a Vaishnava and held that close to his heart all the days of his life. And even more so, he was joyful in everything he did. And oftentimes we get caught up in rules and regulation, religion, um, what to do and what not to do, or 
Even worse, in the society of devotees, we sometimes have a falling out with another devotee. We don't like what they said, what they did, how they treated me. Uh, they shouldn't have done that. They should have respected me more. But Govinda Maharaj was non-envious. He was famous in the Gaudiya Mutt for being able to enter any Gaudiya Mutt anywhere or any other mission for that matter and treat people with dignity, with respect, and with joy. And he transmitted that sweetness, that happiness, and that joy everywhere he went. And he was always respectful to others. So far beyond having the attitude of, oh, I'm a great soul, I'm a great guru, bow down to me. He was never like that. He was always, well, what do you think? He was ready to listen to anybody and, and consider their opinion without just discarding it as insignificant. And uh, that, 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 his personal example was a great inspiration. So if Prabhupada taught discipline, how to act and how to live, if Sri Dharmarsh taught how to think, how to analyze, how to see something from different points of view, how to use your intelligence, then uh, Govinda Maharaj teaches us joy, the joy of living, the joy of devotion, and the joy of bhakti. Uh, it's very cool to hear all these patterns of this like spiritual maha puzzles coming all together in one in one straightforward uh, <laughs> logics like discipline, joy, and thinking. Like from discipline, you start thinking well, and from thinking well, you become joyful. Well, that makes real sense. Thank you very much for sharing this. Uh, and well, and thank you for calling me and, and including me, and in, once again in your Veda life. Uh, festival uh, and I'm very happy to say hello to all my friends in Ukraine, Strasvitsya, uh, you say Lubov, Mir, uh, Hare Krishna. Lubov, <laughs> Mir, <laughs> and Mahayaki Prabhu. So, um, what, uh, can I ask one, I had a lot of questions for you actually, you know, I, I usually sometimes have questions. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's hard for me to give short answers. No, no, no. I, I, you just, you just. I'm, I'm. We are all dwelling on the subject, listening to you. We, are, you are, you are a brilliant speaker, Mahayogi Prabhu. So, um, the question is uh, uh, as follows. Well, right now I'm talking to you, and what I'm thinking is, what I'm thinking is, how lucky I am to have an opportunity, not only to know you, but also to speak to you and ask you some real important questions about life about spirituality like about everything because you're an elderly respected experienced person and the question is next um well right now well who do you ask questions when you have questions because like your gurus have left this world but they are in the heart and when sometimes you are maybe in a situation when you strongly need to ask someone for some recommendation how do you cope with this? Do you like ask questions like you just said? You ask yourself, what would Prabhupada or Shridhar Maharaj do, or what? That's a very good question, Chutananda. Yeah, it's like I said, uh, long distance sadhu sangha. It's not only a question of communicating over distance, like we're doing now, but mm -hmm. over time as well. So, yeah, I think back to when I was sitting before Sri Dharmaraj and I had a problem and I asked him a question. And one day he leaned forward and he said, you know. And I was like, what? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> you know. And his point was, you've heard enough. You know, I've given you hours and hours and hours and hours of instruction. Put it into practice. Do it. He said, follow your star. And I thought, wow, that's great. Follow my star. So the, the advice is there. We know what to do. Uh, it's very difficult to wake up a man who's pretending to be asleep. And sometimes that's our mind. Our intelligence knows this is the path. Follow the path. Do it. But our mind is telling us, now oh, five more exactly. minutes, I'm just going to keep sleeping. So, 
There's mm -hmm. that, right? There's the instruction you got from your guru that's solid and you know. Then there's also the, the Shastra, you know? And sometimes that's yeah. a great help. You can go to the scripture, you can go to the book, you can read the book and find something there. Then again, there's the, the Sangha. I can call a Chutananda up and say, what do I do, a Chutananda? I'm lost. Help me. Oh. And <laughs> even though he's I was younger, like, I'm the key of maybe, <laughs> maybe he knows something. In the, in the Sri Guru and His Grace book, the problem, the central problem is who is Guru? And at one point, Sri Dharmaraj refers us to the 11th canto of the Bhagavatam, the discussion with Uddhava. And mm -hmm. at one point, uh, Uddhava is asking Krishna this, and Krishna tells the story of the Avadut. And the Avadut has 24 gurus, and he lists them. Uh, there's the pigeon, the prostitute, the water, the earth, the fire, uh, the holy man. He lists a number of different it's there in the, the Uddhava Gita. The donkey was there also, I guess. Uh, yeah, I remember, I remember this. So, yeah, yeah, very, very nice analogies. I, so the idea is anybody can be your guru. I like to paint, for example. My mother paint, and she taught me. So sometimes I like to paint, it relaxes my mind. And uh, sometimes I pick up the paintbrush, and I'm about to put some color down, and I can hear her telling me, why are you putting blue? You use too much blue. Come on, what's wrong with gray? You know? So, yeah. sometimes there's the inner guru who tells you, don't do this, do that. And that guru can come in many forms. Maybe you're waiting in line in the supermarket and you become impatient. And uh, the person in front of you turns to you and says, hey, be humble. And you go, oh, wait a minute. Trinata peace you need China. Tarora peace you Oh, that's, that's Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. This person is my guru. So, as you become more attuned to the message of your guru, you can hear that coming through, through various people. Of course, it's always best to connect with someone who's an authority, who's authorized. So, when I'm really in doubt, I try to connect with Avidut Maharaj or Bhakti Sudhir Goswami because uh, I look to them for spiritual guidance. So th there you go. I've got Guru, Sadhu, Shastra, God Brothers, the Sangha, Long Distance, uh, Time Machine, and uh, Goswami Maharaj and Avidut Maharaj. After that, there's Pritu. <laughs> there's Pritu. Yeah. And uh, all of you. Oh. And Mahayo Prabhu, you mentioned like what Shilastar Maharaj told you, follow your star. And I'm yeah. be, I'm seeing that you are really following your star. And so right now at this point of your life, what can you say about Krishna consciousness? Does did your um attitude approach or understanding of it like what it is real what? like what is real krishna consciousness change for the course of time like what you thought krishna consciousness was in like 1982 in 1992 and right now in 2020 did it change your like your understanding your feeling your approaches towards this vast transcendental vague massive amount of consciousness i don't know did it change your that's a really good your... that's a really good question you know nobody's really asked me that I have that question. I, I want to ask Goswami Maharaj for that. You know, sometimes you want to turn to somebody and say, okay, so you dedicated 50 years of your life to this. Did it work? You know, are you there? <laughs> have you reached, right? Have you reached Samadhi? Are you dancing with the gopis? You know, oh. uh, <laughs> you know, right? Yeah, yeah. But I would say, I would say this, you know, uh, I had that question when I went to see Sri Dharmaraj, right? I'd mm -hmm. seen Sri when I When I read Srila Prabhupada's books, I was convinced this is real. 
And I was more convinced when I met him and, you know, walked with him on the beach uh, for morning walk and japa and speak the Bhagavatam. But as time progressed and he disappeared, you know, I fell into doubt. You know, I had serious doubts. Is this real? You know, that's the question. And, but when I went to India and I met Sridhar Maharaj, I felt like this is somebody who just stepped out of Vaikuntha to sit here with me. You know? Uh, yes. Or, or he has one foot in Vrindavan and the other foot's here and he's testing with his with his hand he's the chintamani sand of uh, the jamuna you know and he's trying to tell me what that is but he's there you know this is real and i felt that also with govinda Maharaj. i felt this is real and sometimes i personally have moments like that where i, where I know this is real. There's no doubt in my mind. Sometimes when I'm dreaming, sometimes I dream about, I don't dream about Krishna and the gopis. I think that's inaccessible. I think that Sridhar told us, Pujala Ragapat, Gaurava Bhangi, uh, Matala Harijana, uh, Kirtana Rangi. He said, you know, our business is with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the Kirtan. And all that higher stuff will come. You know, uh, uh -huh. we carry that on our, you know, our business is not to talk about, you know, Lalita Saki and Radharani and all that. It's, it's yeah, way sir. too high. Uh -huh. uh, Sridhar Maharaj, he, he's, he's censored uh, Mirabai, uh, as is our tradition, saying that, you know, she's not the real thing. And how do you know? Because her connection is direct. It's always with Krishna. She did this with Krishna. She did that with Krishna. But there's nobody else there. There's no entourage. Any king must have his court jester, his ministers, the army, the generals, his elephants. Uh, Krishna's sure. like that. He doesn't exist in a vacuum. So our business is with the entourage. Our business is with the line that flows from, you know, Rupa and Raghunath to Kaviraj Goswami to Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, you know, Bhakti Vidanta Swami, Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Dev Goswami, you know, Bhakti Sundar Govinda Maharaj, and the rest. You know, that's so. Like in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, sometimes it says just by remembering, I don't know, Abhiram uh, Thakur. Uh, your liberation is guaranteed just by remembering the pastime of Nityananda Prabhu breaking the danda of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, like that. Not to be blasphemous, but today, by remembering devotees like Jayananda, who founded the Jagannath Puri festival in the United States, or even the ex members of the Guardian Devotion Press, like Yudhamanyu, Shruta Shrava, who became Sanyasi Maharaj. Vaishnava Maharaj, you know, uh, Chittananda Prabhu, I forget his sannyas name, all those who walked with us on the path and who have moved on, uh, we can think, yes, this is real. And just to drive a nail into the coffin of the argument, uh, there's always the Omkara, because Srila Sridhar she would say, Om. What does Om mean? A big yes. So if you have any doubt, just close your mouth and listen. And you can hear Om. And what is Om? It's an affirmation. It's divine sound. Uh, the background sound of the universe telling you it is. Yes, it's real. So have I progressed? That's a really good question. I think hum, in my, you know, highest aspiration, I think maybe I've progressed to the point where in my next life, I might get the chance to have the association of devotees like uh, Avarut Maharaj, uh, Goswami Maharaj, yourself, you know, maybe even uh, 
Bhakti Sundar, Govinda Maharaj, Sri Dharma, Srila Prabhupada, great devotees come once in a generation. You know, if I'm lucky, I don't really aspire to Goloka Vrindavan or Vaikuntha. I don't think I'm made of that kind of material yet, you know. But there's something yeah. in my soul that vibrates, you know, it vibrates with the Sankirtan. Once they, uh, the doctors examined uh, Babaji Maharaj, Krishnadas Babaji, and uh, they listened to his heart, you know, and Babaji Maharaj says, what do you hear? And the doctor said, I hear the kirtan of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Haridas Thakur. Well, this is sweet you to know? hear. Yeah. Yeah. Of, of course, maybe the doctor was just telling me he had arrhythmia, you know, or, or a syncopated heartbeat. But, yeah, so I like to think that, that it's funny. Sometimes when uh, I hear, I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. Sometimes if I hear a truck going down the street, like in a distance, and making a low kind of a boom, bada, boom, bada, boom, rumble, I think it's cure time. It sounds like the Murdanga. So, is that progress? Maybe it is. I don't know. Pray for me. <laughs> pray okay, for dear me. Dear Mahayagi Prabhu, I'll pray for you, and please, you pray for me and for my family. And with a, with, with a full sorrow in my heart, the guys tell me, please, Achuta, stop it. It is time to end the lecture, because you. it's very interesting to listen to you, but we have some more on the show Good. on the road coming and they just say guys please stop because we'll be hearing you till the morning and some other guys might let might me know where you're time. sharing this okay <laughs> uh, okay, I'll, okay i'll tell you uh, thank you very much for asking for uh for for telling such nice words for being so kind to me for remembering me for remembering us all actually for remembering ukraine because we also remember you we love you so much and we love also and so we invite you once again when all this situation with the covid will be easier please come here and we'll be glad to meet you and hen 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 as well and listen to words of wisdom and uh, right now i think I Hare Krishna. all right <laughs> adios Джай, Бхакти Дан Махайоги Прабуки, Джай. А с нами был наш дорогой гость Махайоги. И все закончилось, мне кажется. Нас отключили.